Our goal in this video is to talk to the COVID Tracking Project API in order to retrieve the data that we need for our application. The way we'll go about doing this is by using the API created by the COVID Tracking Project. Our phone, or our application, is the client, and we're going to be making a request to the COVID Tracking Project and getting a response which contains the data. We're going to be making a GET request on this particular URL API slash v1 slash us slash daily.json. And what that represents is we want to retrieve the daily data of the number of coronavirus cases nationwide. And the COVID tracking project will respond with the JSON data. And that JSON data will contain the metrics for each day up until the most recent day. In addition to getting the data nationally, we'd also like to be able to get the per state data for coronavirus. And in order to do that, there's one more endpoint in the API that we'll need to hit. And that will give us back a list of the data per day per state. Now we have an idea of what we're trying to do, we can start the implementation. We're going to use a library called Retrofit on Android, which makes working with APIs really straightforward. What I have here is a totally empty Android project. So if I run it now, you'll see the emulator showing the Hello World application. The first thing I'm gonna do is go into the Android manifest file and because we're talking to an API over the internet, we need the internet permission in our application. Let's start typing uses permission internet. The next step is to include Retrofit in our project. So what I have open here is the official site for Retrofit, which is a library developed by Square. And I'm gonna to go to the download section so we can figure out how can we include this library into our project. So here you can see it says for Gradle, which is what we're using, you need to include this line. I'm gonna copy this. And notice that it says insert latest version here, so we're going to fill that in later. But I'm going to go into our project and go into build.gradle. And make sure you're going into the build.gradle, which is located in the app module. And then in the, in the dependency section, I'm going to add one more dependency, which is for retrofit. In order to get the latest version, I'm going to open up GitHub and tap on releases. And you can see that the most recent release is 2.9.0. So let's replace this with 2.9.0. One more thing that you'll need in order to use Retrofit is a converter. So if I tap on the section around Retrofit configuration, the converters are used by Retrofit to translate the API response into a model that we can work with in our application. And I'll talk more about what that means later on. We're going to use JSON for this. So I'll copy the dependency for JSON go back into Android Studio and paste that in with the same version number as what we used for Retrofit. Finally, the last thing we'll need to do before we can build our project is instruct Gradle to use Java 1.8. And the reason for this is because more recent versions of Retrofit use a component which uses a Java 8 feature, which are lambdas. So in order to enable Java 8, we go up into the Android section of the build.gradle file. Hit enter a few times, and we're gonna add a section here called compile options. In this section, we're gonna have two lines, one for source compatibility and the other for target compatibility. And for both of these, the value was going to be Java version, version 1.8. At this point, it's worth making sure that we haven't screwed up yet. So I'm gonna tap sync now, and we see a sync success. The next thing is let's build our project, and we don't expect any UI or functional changes, but we should still be able to build the project and see hello world. In order to use Retrofit, the first thing I like to do is define a new file, which is an interface that Retrofit will consume in order to talk to our API. The way that works is we're going to create a new interface file in the same directory where main activity is located. And let's define a new file here, a new Kotlin file, and call this COVID service. The idea of this COVID service interface is that we're going to have one function defined here for each endpoint in the API. So like we talked about earlier, there are two endpoints that we're interested in. One, which is for getting the national data per day, and I'll call that get national data. And the other is for getting the per state data, and I'll call that get states data, plural because we're getting the data across multiple states. The way retrofit works is that we need to add in a corresponding annotation for each method defined in our interface. So for example, we're doing a get request on the endpoint us slash daily.json for getting all the national data. Next, we'll add a return value for each method that we've defined. Retrofit and JSON will automatically take the JSON data returned from the API and turn that into data models that we can use in our application. 
this is going to be enclosed in something called a call object that Retrofit gives to us. And then our job is to define the data class that we'll actually be using in our application. And I'll call that COVID data. So we're going to have the return value be a call, which is a list of COVID data because there'll be one element in the data we get back for each day. The return value for the other function in our interface is going to be the same, a list of COVID data, and I'll show that to you later. And the annotation is going to be similar again, except for the endpoint is states slash daily.json instead of US. One thing that's worth noting about this API, which is really nice, is that there's no authentication or API key that you need in order to use it. So now let's define this data class COVID data. I'm going to again open up the project tool window and let's define a new Kotlin file which defines COVID data. COVID data class is going to be a data class which represents the data that we care about from the JSON object in the API. We're going to use an annotation called serialized name, which defines the mapping of the JSON key to the variable that we want to map it to in our data class. So for example, there's a key in the JSON object called date checked, and we're going to map that to a string, which is also called date checked. And I'm going to show you that in the actual JSON result that we get from the API. So what I have here is the documentation for the COVID tracking project API. And if you scroll down, you can actually see the different endpoints available in this API. The data that we're getting back right now is historic US value. And we can issue the get request in the browser in order to dive into the JSON data. And you can see the data that we're getting back is enclosed in this JSON array. That's what these square brackets mean. And inside of this JSON array are different JSON objects. This represents one day worth of COVID-19 metrics for the US. The COVID data class that we've defined in our project represents one JSON object here. And the attribute that we've already parsed out is this one called date checked. So we're actually parsing out this string. We're going to ignore a lot of the attributes in the JSON object, but because we're interested in the change per day, the attributes we are going to parse out are negative increase, positive increase, and depth increase. In addition, when we are querying for state data, we're also going to care about an attribute called state. So I'm going to include one attribute in COVID data for each of the JSON keys that we just talked about, positive increase, negative increase, and depth increase. In addition, we're also going to have one more key for the US state that this data represents. One optimization we can do is if the serialized name exactly matches with the name of the variable, we can get rid of the serialized name annotation. And that's the case for each attribute that we've defined. I'm going to go ahead and delete the serialized name for all of them. One thing we should fix here is that the positive increase, negative increase, and death increase won't be of type string, but they'll actually be of type integer because they represent the number of new cases found in each of these categories. So now we've defined the COVID data class. We can go back into COVID service and we can see that the red underlines have gone away. Now we can put all the pieces together in main activity. The onCreate function will get called by the Android system when our application boots up, when our activity is being created. At that point, we want to make the API request to fetch the national data so that we can display a chart on the screen showing it. We'd also like to get the state data because as soon as we get the state data back, we can populate our dropdown or spinner so the user is able to drill down into a particular state. Here's where we're going to use Retrofit. The first thing we'll do is create an instance of JSON using the JSON Builder because we're going to need that to create an instance of Retrofit. We use the Retrofit Builder, pass in a base URL, which I'm going to do shortly, and add in a converter factory where we pass in the JSON converter factory and pass in the JSON object, and then we can call .build. We can now use the COVID service class that we created in order to create an instance of the COVID service. And on this, we can call the methods that we had defined. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but first let's go back and define the base URL as a constant up here. So in COVID service, we defined the end of the URL, which is us slash daily.json. And if we go back to the browser, you can see that that basically captured this last portion of the URL. The base URL will be everything except for that, which will be this portion in the beginning. So I can capture that, put it here, and let's add this in in our 
retrofit builder. Let's go back and uncomment this COVID service I get at national data. And I mentioned how in COVID service, the return value is not the model data directly, but something which is wrapped inside of a retrofit call object. And the reason for this is because of the asynchronous nature of doing anything with network calls. So we get back this call object because that is how we get notified of the success or failure of our API request. So on the call object that we get back, we'll enqueue a callback. And this callback will be parameterized by list of COVID data. So we're going to copy that in. We can now override the methods that are required as part of the callback. So if I tap on the red light bulb, we can have Android Studio help us to implement these members. There are two methods, on failure and on response. We'll override both of them. And in on failure, all we want to do is log an error. Something went wrong with the API call. So we're going to put a log.e, which means log at error level, put the tag, and then uh, indicate on failure, and also include the throwable t, which is included. So let's define the tag at the top of the file. And my convention for that is always to have the tag name be the class name. For the on response method, the first thing we'll do is simply log at info level that we entered into the on response method. And we'll also include the actual response that we get back. Next, the body of the response will contain the list of COVID data that we should have been able to parse from the API. If this data, which represents the national data, is null, that means we got an invalid response from the server, and we should log something at warning level, so log.w, and just indicate that uh, something went wrong. Once we've gotten past this if statement, we know at this point that our data is valid. What we'll do here is save the national data into a member variable, which is accessible throughout the whole main activity class. So I'm going to define national daily data and define that as a property on main activity. And this is going to create for us a late init var national daily data, which is a list of COVID data. One important point here is that the data we get back from the API starts with the most recent data. However, for graphing purposes, we'd like to start our data with the oldest data first. And so we're going to call national data.reverse in order to get the proper ordering. For now, the only other thing I'll do in this method is add a log statement, which indicates that we're going to figure out in a subsequent video how to take this national daily data and display it in a line chart. To finish up this video, I want to also fetch the state data and then validate that, th that this is actually working. What we've done so far is used retrofit to talk to the API and automatically convert the JSON data we get back into a class we defined called COVID data, which includes attributes such as a date of when this data is relevant, number of positive cases, negative cases, deaths, and when we talk to the state endpoint, we also want to know the state that this data is relevant for. So I'm going to represent this in this light orange blob, which has COVID data inside of it, and it contains a particular date. What we just did for the national daily data is we reversed the order of the list that we got back from the API. So the oldest COVID data is at the front of the list, and the most recent is at the end of the list. So a similar logic applies for the state data. But there is a wrinkle because all the state data is combined in one large list. We'll get all the data for all states from May 1st, then May 2nd, and then and so on and so forth. However, in terms of being able to graph the data, all we really care about, for example, is being able to retrieve all of the data relevant for Alaska. And so what our job is, is to take this big list of data and pull out all the data relevant to Alaska and put that into a separate list. So the idea is that we're going to take this big list and break it down into a map. And that map will have a key of the state, and the value will be all the COVID data relevant to that state. So with that understanding, now we can define the state data. So I'm going to do something quite similar. So I'll say COVID service dot get states data and queue it. And this is actually going to be quite similar. So I'm going to initially just copy all this. And we're going to leave the log messages here. But instead of calling the return value of response.body as national data, this should be called states data. So 
similar to what we had before, we first want to reverse the whole list we get back, but then we want to group this large list down on a per state basis. We're going to call this nice group by method in Kotlin and pass in the argument that we want to group by. And that'll be the state attribute of every COVID data object. So this is actually going to return to us a map rather than a list. So I'm going to call this per state daily data, and then we're going to create a property inside of activity. So again, this property can be accessed throughout the whole class, which we're going to use in subsequent videos. And this is a map between a string, which is a state, and a list of COVID data, which is the chronologically increasing COVID data over time. Once we've computed this per state daily data, the next thing is we'll want to update that dropdown or that spinner with the state data. So that'll happen in a later video. Before we try this out, the last thing I'd like to do is make one small improvement. If we go back to COVID data, you'll notice that this attribute date checked is a string. However, in order to do computation and make it easier to display this date in different ways, we would actually like to have this date check to be of type date, Java util date, rather than a string. And so in order to make that happen, I can define it as a date here, but we need to pass in another method in the JSON builder. So that JSON will know how to convert the date string and turn it into a Java date object. That can be done by calling this method set date format, and you pass in a pattern. The pattern that the API that we're working with complies with is the following. So with that, we should be able to properly parse out dates. All right, so now we can finally try this out. What I'm going to do to validate that we have something working is go into the onResponse method and where we have a log statement, once we've computed the national daily data, let's put a breakpoint right there. And now instead of running the app like normal, hit this button for debug app. So as soon as our program installs and we get into this on response method, our program should halt execution at this point. And so you can see that that happened. Here we can take a look at what is the value of this variable, national daily data that we had just computed. So you can see that the size of this list is 134, which is sensible because that means that we have 134 days worth of data. And if I expand this, we should ideally see all of this sorted chronologically. So the oldest day is January 22nd, January 23rd. So it is ordered, which is great. And it goes all the way up until the most recent day. So this gives us confidence that we are able to parse all the data properly. And you can also see the other values like positive increase, negative increase, death increase. Those are also being parsed out properly here. Now that we have the data, which will power our whole application in the next video, we are going to build out the UI, which will display the chart and the metrics. If you like what you've built so far, drop me a like and hit the subscribe button so you know when the next part will come out. See you in the next video.